Bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. Lord, as we open your word, we want to know the truth so the truth can set us free. In Jesus' name, amen. Matthew chapter 25, I'm using the new living translation. I'm not going to preach long today because we have a seminar at 3 o'clock and I hope the majority of you will come back for it. Um, I may not look like it, but in six days I'll be 60 years old. <laughs> so I have to pace myself now. I'm learning to pace myself. The Bible says, again, the kingdom of heaven can be illustrated by the story of a man going on a long trip. He called together his servants and entrusted his money to them while he was gone. He gave five bags of silver to one, two bags of silver to another, and one bag of silver to the last, dividing it in proportion to their abilities. He then left on his trip. The servant who received the five bags of silver began to invest the money and earned five more. The servant with two bags of silver also went to work and earned two more. But the servant who received the one bag of silver dug a hole in the ground and hid the master's money. After a long time, their master returned from his trip and called them to give an account of how they had used his money. The servant to whom he had entrusted the five bags of silver came forward with five more and said, Master, you gave me five bags of silver to invest, and I have earned five more. 
The master was full of praise. Well done, my good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in handling this small amount. So now I will give you many more responsibilities. Let's celebrate together. The servant who had received the two bags of silver came forward and said, Master, you gave me two bags of silver to invest, and I have earned two more. The master said, Well done, my good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in handling this small amount, so now I will give you many more responsibilities. Let's celebrate together. Then the servant with the one bag of silver came and said, Master, I knew you were a harsh man, harvesting crops you didn't plant and gathering crops you didn't cultivate. I was afraid I would lose your money. So I hid it in the earth. Look, here is your money back. But the master replied, you wicked and lazy servant. If you knew I harvest crops I didn't plant and gathered crops I didn't cultivate, why didn't you deposit my money in the bank? At least I could have gotten some interest on it. Then he ordered, take the money from this servant and give it to the one with the ten bags of silver. To those who use well what they are given, even more will be given, and they will have an abundance. But from those who do nothing, even what little they have will be taken away. Now throw this useless servant into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. The lesson is in verse 29. To those who use well what they are given, even more will be given, and they will have an abundance. But from those who do nothing, even what little they have will be taken away. If I were to summarize this parable, I would use two words, be faithful. The thing that I love about God is he never anywhere in scripture says be successful. He simply says be faithful. Faithfulness leads to certain results. But the beautiful thing about the kingdom of God Results belong to God. Our job is to be faithful. Revelation 2.10, my mother and father's favorite verse, Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give you a crown of life. Faithfulness is to be reliable. So the concept of stewardship is managing something that belongs to someone else. As a servant, Everything belongs to God. I don't need to go through all of the text. I'll still state them for those who have not been exposed. Psalms 24, 1, everything on earth belongs to God. Psalms 50, 10 through 12, every living thing on earth belongs to God. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20, even our bodies belong to God. Nothing we have belongs to us. Acts 17, 28, for in him... We live and move and have our being, as certain also of your poets have said, for we are also his offspring. Anything we can do or accomplish is because of the blessing of God upon us. Reference text Genesis 1, 28, Deuteronomy 8, 18. It is with the blessing of God that we serve as servants. Bob Dylan wrote a song and he sang it. He said, you're going to have to serve somebody. Well, it may be the devil or it may be the Lord, but you're going to have to serve somebody. The concept of stewardship is managing something that belongs to someone else 
as a servant. 1 Corinthians 4, 1 and 2. Let a man so account of us or audit us as of the ministers or servants of Christ and stewards, that word steward in this text as the context of a servant, of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required in stewards that a person be found reliable. God is looking for reliability, and this parable teaches us. Some scholars say the talents, as it said in the King James Version, the talents were worth 6,000 days of wages. So, if the man with five talents was given five times 6,000 days, that's 82 years, 82.19 years worth of money. Two talent man had 32.88 years worth of money. The first one talent man had 16.44 years worth of money. However you add it up, none of them was given little, although we think of the one with the one as only having little. So my first point is, whatever little talent you think you have, it's much greater than you give it credit for. God doesn't give us insignificant gifts. God gives us gifts, every one of which is significant. Some have a lot, some have a little in comparison, but no gift is tiny or insignificant. If we knew that, we would be able to understand this quote from one of my favorite books. It's Christ Object Lessons. In chapter 25, there is an expose of this talent. I'm going to read two paragraphs because they're impactful to me. Many whom God has qualified to do excellent work accomplish very little. I'm going to say that again. I wanted to get everyone's attention. Many whom God has qualified to do excellent work accomplish very little because they attempt little. Thousands pass through life as if they had no definite object for which to live, no standard to reach. Such will obtain a reward proportionate to their works. This says to me, all of us could probably do more than we're doing, but we only attempt little for various reasons, and we may discuss some of them. The second paragraph says, remember that you will never reach a higher standard than you yourself set. You will never reach a higher standard than you yourself set. Then set your mark high and step by step, even though it be by painful effort, by self-denial and sacrifice, ascend the whole length of the ladder of progress. Notice it's not the ladder to, of success. It's the ladder of progress. We should be making progress. Let nothing hinder you. Fate has not woven its meshes about any human being so firmly that he need remain helpless and in uncertainty. Opposing circumstances should create a firm determination to overcome them. The breaking down of one barrier will give greater ability and courage to go forward. Press with determination in the right direction. And circumstances will be your helpers, not your hindrances. A lot of times we feel like we're being hindered when in fact the opposition is helping to make us stronger. But we don't view it that way. 
because we think that if life doesn't happen the way we outline it, then life is against me. Sometimes those great obstacles are put there as your greatest blessing. We can never see from God's perspective. And if we know, he says, I have loved you with an everlasting love, and it's with loving kindness that I draw you, there's nothing in our path that he does not first weigh and then decide it's good for us. Now everything is not good, but everything, God, everything works together for our good. Everything is not good, but everything can work for our good. And we can never use as an excuse, everything is against me. Let me tell you something. The, the devil is walking around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may destroy 24-7, 365. He doesn't take a vacation. He doesn't take naps. He doesn't take breaks. He constantly has somebody on our track to mess us up. But likewise, God has angels who excel in strength, who camp round about them that fear him and keep his commandments. Even though the attack is coming, he's even given to each one of us the shield of faith, which is able to quench the fiery darts of the devil. The weapon is always going to form. But it cannot prosper. It's not going to work unless you give up. Just before the, 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 the parable of the talents is the parable of the virgins. The parable of the, of the virgins teaches us we must be internally filled with the Holy Spirit to be ready to live with Jesus. And we do not know when Jesus is coming back. That's why he left an instruction. Occupy until I come. When are you coming, Jesus? I'm coming soon. When is soon? Well, for some folks, soon is today. Because the day you die, your record is over. We now only get to review your record. You can't make more record. It's done. And there's review. So if you die today, he's coming today because the very next thing you see is the coming of the Lord. Either you'll be in the first resurrection, Revelation talks about it, or you'll be in the second resurrection. I, by God's grace, will be in the first resurrection. And I will be caught up together with the Lord to meet y'all in the air. And we will forever be with the Lord. Those who rise in the second resurrection will see the city Jerusalem coming down. And if they're not in there, they got a problem. <laughs> because <laughs> one writer says the Lord will elevate above the city. And will show in panoramic view everybody's sin that are not in the city. That's one reason I want to be in the city. <laughs> I don't need you reviewing my sins. And the reason that he's going to do it is because the accusation would come, God is not fair. That was the first accusation in heaven when Lucifer turned to a third of the angels and convinced them, God is not fair. You see how talented I am. You see how powerful I am. You see how beautiful I am. And they won't let me into the inner sanctum when they have their meetings. That's not fair. That's what he... <laughs> We've got a budding preacher. <laughs> That's not fair. That, and so God is going to show everybody... So that the text will come true, everyone will bow their knee and say, Just and true are thy ways.
thou king of saints. Nobody is going to be able to say he didn't give me a chance. God is chasing every one of us down every day, trying to have a relationship with us. And even though we're not quite sure how to have the relationship, open your heart to him. Read the Bible. Learn what God is all about and try to have a relationship with him. That's enough. He says, if you open the door of your heart, I will come in. I will come in. And I will be in relationship with you. So we first find out we need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not a force or an essence. The Holy Spirit is the third person of the Godhead. And he comes and guides us. Next thing is the talents that tells us we must be externally productive to be with Jesus. Because he's going to audit our activities. So we need to be internally filled and externally productive. God gives his belongings to his people. I just started this whole message with nothing belongs to us and nothing ever will belong to us. Not even our body. Nothing will ever belong. Everything we have is God's and it is his desire that we be faithful with what we have. Something else I learned, everything we have is enough for what God needs us to do. We have enough because he doesn't plan for us to just stay where we are. He plans for us to invest. Investing is different than spending. When you spend, it's gone. When you invest, you expect something to come back. God invested in us. He's asking us to invest. So there are three things we want to say in the next 15 minutes. God gives his belongings to his servants according to their ability. There's no sense in being jealous of anybody else's gift because if he gave you what they had, you couldn't handle it. You might even have the same gifts, but you can only handle your gift the way you can handle your gift. So he gives according to ability. Number two, God expects us to increase what he has given us. And number three, there are consequences for our response to God's expectations of us. We first find in this parable as this master who represents Christ is going on his trip, he calls, he calls his three servants. He calls his three servants. He calls them. Now why am I stressing? He calls them because God calls us. <laughs> you are here because he called you here. If you know anything about reproduction, the song is true. Millions didn't make it. <laughs> but you were one of the ones who did. That was not by happenstance. God was involved in that. He called you and he made you. I've read the text to you before. <laughs> It's not that funny now. <laughs> he, he, he called, I read the text before that before we were formed in the womb, God knew us. He knew every day we would live. He had already ordered our steps. He knows where we're headed. We, he knows what we're going through. That all happened before we were even a twinkle in our parents' eyes. God knows us intimately, and he calls us, and he called these three. He said, I've got a five-talent man, I've got a two-talent man, and I've got a one-talent man. And I called all three of them. Five-talent man wasn't called more than the one-talent man. He called all three. 
and he gave them what they could handle. He didn't give them more than they could handle, but he gave them enough to present a challenge. There are some things we all do so easily we don't even think they are a talent. In fact, you think everybody could do what you do because you do it so easily it couldn't possibly be a special skill. Wow. <laughs> it's just that easy. You mean you can't do that too? <laughs> that, that's great, but even that God expects us to ramp up a notch. To invest, we ought to be able to go beyond, to stretch. Now, if we were going to talk about music, I guarantee you our great musicians weren't that great when they first started. Do I have a witness? They weren't that great, but they practiced and messed up and practiced and messed up. Here's the beautiful thing about failure. Failure paves the road to success. In other words, if you want to succeed faster, you need to fail faster. If you want to succeed faster, you've got to be willing to fail faster. You've got to be willing. Sometimes we step back because we don't want to experience the uncomfortable feeling of failure or what we call failure. My opinion is, it's not failure, it's a life lesson. It's not failure, it's a life lesson. It's something that helps us to know, like, like, like the great inventor said, I, it, it took me 10,000 times to find out how not to make a light bulb. He didn't count all of those experiences and experiments as a failure, he counted them as a lesson. Well, I know how not to see, but one of our problems is how many of us could have gotten to 10,000 times? Some of us can't get to 10. Okay, I tried it two times. I think I'd better move on to something else. No, if you've got to, see, that's why I want you to come this afternoon at 3 o'clock. I want to talk to you about finding out what God has in his mind for you. In particular, you. And then how do I focus my life so I'm not distracted? I have to tell you, it's taken me decades to figure some of this stuff out. That you're going to get in a couple of hours. And, and, yeah, and, and there are days I get up and say, Lord God, are you ever going to speak to me? <laughs> he has spoken. And sometimes we just don't like what he has to say. Yeah, uh, they all knew, if you look at the three of them, they all knew what was expected. They knew that that money was not given to them to spend, and it wasn't given to them to hold. It was given to them to invest. So when the master came back, they said, the first two, I have invested. They knew what was required. What is the Lord going to hear from you about what he has put inside of you? Will he say, well done, or will he say, why didn't you do something with this? They all knew there would be a reward, too. That's something else I like about God. He's always giving advantages to us even when we don't deserve them. It's a privilege to have what we have and to use what we have and to enjoy what we have but on top of it if we will be faithful with what we have he'll give us a reward for having been faithful I don't know if that excites you but that excites me but sometimes we allow our emotions to get in the way of what we know what do you mean you know some of the giftings that you have and you know some of the things you're trying to achieve. But like the third servant, fear will get in your way. Fear, in my view, is the greatest destroyer of blessings in the Christian's life. Fear. Because fear 
tranquilizes faith. And without faith, it is impossible to please him. So here we are afraid, wanting to pre please God, if fear is an emotion, and we're afraid, wanting to please God, but we can't please God because faith has been tranquilized. Faith has been put on ice. Faith has been set to the side. Faith has been displaced by paralyzing fear. And it keeps us from making progress. And all God wants is progress. Progress. One little tiny step in the right direction after one little tiny step in the right direction. That's called progress. Sometimes that gets in our way. Now I believe every Christian has been entrusted with some kind of responsibility to God in the kingdom of God for the building of the kingdom of God. Unfortunately, in the average church, only two out of ten people are actively engaged in the ministry of the church. Only two out of ten. And those two work themselves into a frenzy until the two start saying, next time I'm going to rest. And I have a message for everybody. Don't work yourself to death. Do what God has asked you to do, but once you know what that is, don't keep doing more. What? What are you saying? <laughs> I'm saying sometimes we forsake some of the more important obligations in our life in order to be pat on the back at church. And there are eight out of ten who are coming to enjoy the program but are not engaged in any kind of ministry. So I'm asking that at least we double it to four out of ten. <laughs> that we increase, that everybody find something to do in the ministry of the church. Something to do. One thing, one thing, this one thing I do. Be like Paul. This one thing I do. But do this one thing because God has put the ability in you and he wants you to invest it so that it will increase. I got two amens. I'm saying don't wait for the election. Find a spot to serve in. Because if Jesus comes back and he says, hey, I expected you would be involved. Why weren't you? When you say to him, they wouldn't let me, he's not going to hear it. They wouldn't let me. They didn't select me. They didn't, uh, no, it's not about they, it's about you. I gave it to you. So what are you doing? Two of the three in the story immediately went to work. One basically just sucked his teeth. Two took risks. One took no risk. But after a long time, now that's a good part of the story. Now we want Jesus to come right now. We would even so, Lord Jesus, come. If he were to come, some of us be messed up. God is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness. But is long suffering to usward. I like that old King James. Usward. Not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. The reason Christ was gone for a long time was to give them ample opportunity to achieve their potential. This afternoon, I'm going to put a shocking slide up on the screen. It's a sobering slide. It's a slide that will shock the conscience and make you ask, my God, my God, why? I want you to see that slide come this afternoon. 
But he has given us ample opportunity to achieve our potential. But whether we do or whether we don't, he is going to complete an audit. He's going to take a look at what we have done. God expects us to increase. To do what? To do what? His possessions. To take risks to increase his possessions. No less than our best will do. And no excuses will help. There are consequences. So what were the consequences? Those who acted out of, lo out of loving loyalty were celebrated. He said, well done. You've been faithful in this little thing. Now look at this. 6,000 uh, days worth of wages, 80-some years worth of wages in the hands of the man with five. He doubled it. And God says to him, you've been faithful with this little thing I gave you. The thing that we see as so great and much, he said, that was little. Let me show you. I got more for you. And I'm going to give you greater responsibilities. Why? I can trust you. How do I know I can trust you? Because the little bit I gave you, you did a lot with it. So I can trust you. And I'm going to give you more. Come on, let's celebrate. The one with two, he was given, he invested, got two more. It doesn't say how, but he says that he invested. You know, when you invest, the market goes up, the market goes down. And, and he was gone for a long time. So we don't know how long it was and how many losses they had when they took a risk. But they wouldn't stop. That's the thing. You might get knocked down, get back up. Don't stop. Don't allow life to freeze you where you are. You got to press past that. So two of them... And then he gets to this one servant, and here's, he says, uh, he says, you knew. And that's the thing. Nobody's going to be able to say, I didn't know. I would have done better if I knew better. No, I'm only judging you on what you know. The Bible even says, in the time of this ignorance, God winks. In other words, if you don't know, he's not holding it against you. But once you know, he says, now let everybody repent. Once you know, repent doesn't mean, as we saw in Sabbath school today, doesn't mean an intellectual exercise of, oop, I was wrong, sorry about that. Repent means I recognize I am moving in the wrong direction and I want the power of God to help me turn. Now, a lot of us think we turn on our own. We don't. We're going in that direction because that's where we want to go. Don't ever fool yourself. You're not walking in sin because it's an accident. You're going that way because you like it that way. The only way to break that is the Holy Ghost changing us from inside so that the way we're going is no longer so palatable that we're not willing to turn away from it. So when he gets in us and gets us willing for it, it's God that worketh in you both to will and to do his good pleasure. Your desire to turn is not even from you. God gets in us and says, look, I've got a better life. Let me show you something. And we see it. And we say, that looks good, but I don't believe I can ever do that. He says, don't worry about what you can't do. My grace is sufficient. And at some point, we accept that. It is God working in us both to will. And when the will is there, we say, not my will, but thine be done. Now, Lord, I'm willing for you to turn me. Now, I want you to know I'm going to fight with you a little bit because I like this direction. <laughs> you know, the, the, just review your life. You know you're going in the wrong direction because you like going that way. And God says it's time to turn. You say, I want to turn because I don't want to burn in hell, but I do want what I'm getting out of what I'm doing. And I need you to help me to want to. 
That should, that's a good prayer, by the way. Lord, help me to want to do your will because I don't. <laughs> Let's be honest. And then he gets in us and he says, look, just let me, give me the steering wheel. <laughs> let me turn. You're never going to do it. I'll do it. And then we say, thank you, Lord. Repentance is turning and going in the other direction. But the, the poor man that knew what the master expected said, look, at least I didn't lose it. You and I might accept that. You and I might accept that, but the master said, you knew I wanted more than that. So here's what's going to happen. Give me what I gave you, give it back. And I'm going to give it to the one who got ten. Now I'm wondering, you know, I've even heard it as we've discussed it in Sabbath school before. That's not fair. <laughs> the man with the two had four. At least give him one more, he'll have five. Why are you giving the one more to the one that has the most? Because God is not, I don't know what word I want to put there, but he's not that. He's smart. <laughs> what God says is this man is going to maximize what I'm giving him. And therefore, I'm a God of production and progress and maximums. So I'm going to give it to where I'm going to get the best return. That's why he says, those who have shall be given. Those who have not, even that which they have will be taken from them. Why? Because you won't take a risk. You won't exercise faith. You operate in fear. And there's something else the Bible says, the timid and the afraid God cannot save. Why can't he save the timid and afraid? Because they operate out of fear, and fear tranquilizes faith, and without faith it's impossible to please him. We've got to exercise the mustard seed size faith. Just exercise the little bit we've got. A little bit. Exercise it. Just say, Lord, I'm scared to death, but I'm going to step out of the boat anyhow. And if I drown, at least I did what you told me to do. And the beautiful thing about it, even when you start to drown, that's what I learned from Peter, even when you start to drown, and it was his fault, he was starting to drown. But God didn't hold his fault against him. He still saved him. That's a good God right there. So I, I, I need to finish this up. I got more stuff, but... I told you I'd be finished. I'm five minutes over. First Peter 4, 10 and 11 says, As every man hath received the gift, even so minister the same one to another, as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. If any man speak, let him speak as of the oracles of God. If any man minister, let him do it as of the ability which God giveth, that God in all things may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom be praise and dominion forever and ever. Amen. The lesson today is be faithful. Don't worry about success. Just be faithful. If you will be faithful, be thou faithful unto death. And I will give you a crown of life. God gives his belongings to his servants according to their ability. God expects us to increase his possessions. There are consequences for our response to God's expectations of us. Either they'll be good or they'll be bad. He'll say, well done, or he'll say, you're done. Now, which one do you want it to be? Just as I am without one plea. But that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou bidst me come to thee, O Lamb of God, I come. I come as the 
they are playing, we are thinking, Lord, what have you given me? What talents have you given me? Am I investing them? Am I using them for your glory? Have I set my life's bar high enough? Have I just decided to be satisfied or am I climbing ever higher? Am I taking steps in the right direction? Lord, I want to be in line with your will for my life. That's you just raise your hand. Lord, I want to be in line with your will for my life. I don't want to be that wicked servant who's got gifts and talents, but just holding on and sitting on them, hiding them, not using them, not investing, making no risk, taking no risk. I want to do what you'd have me to do so I can give you what you want back from me. That's why I've always said the most important thing is to become fully yourself so that you can present yourself back to God the way he saw you when he gave you life. He sees you further along than we are. So what do we need to adjust in order to be in line with God? 